So I think to say to the, that this is an honor is a, a vast understatement. I'm really, um, my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to the society for, for this recognition. I'll do my best to live up to it. So first of all, uh, my disclosures. I think you can look up those in the app if you want to um, look more at those. But I'm going to really jump right into my presentation uh, with kind of the obligatory uh, AAV introduction slide. I think most of us are familiar with AAV as a gene therapy vector. Um, and if you weren't when you started this meeting, you probably are now. Um, but the, you know, the key things here is that you know, AAV uh, is a, you know, basically a non-pathogenic virus, has been adapted for gene therapy. Um, there's over 100 clinical trials using AAV that are ongoing, uh, and, and, and we're moving into an age where these are becoming actually uh, FDA and EMA approved drugs. So my talk is going to really use AAV9 as a launching pad, and this is, this is a, disease, or a, a vector that I think in a lot of ways has revolutionized uh, our ability to treat a variety of diseases, in particular CNS diseases. And you can kind of divide CNS gene therapy into sort of the pre-AAV9 era and the post-AAV9 era. Um, for me, this journey started, you know, back... Uh, about 10 years ago, and in you know, 2011, we were one of, um, you know, we came after Dr. Uh, Martina Barkett's lab and, and Brian Kaspar's lab to publish um, this finding that if you injected AAV9 intravenously, you would get broad transduction across the brain. Of course, when you, when you look at this, though, uh, in a little bit more detail and look at the biodistribution of AAV9, uh, if you focus on the brain and the spinal cord, and these are just copies of the vector DNA um, per, per mouse cell, you, you can see that uh, really the amount that's going to the brain and the spinal cord, if you note the, dis the difference in the axis looking at the liver, there's between 50 and 100 times more vector that's going to the liver is going to the brain. So in terms of targeting the brain, uh, we are getting the job done. It is going in a dose-responsive manner. Uh, it's not targeting every cell, but it, it, it is pretty impressive. But it's still a reality that less than, you know, far less than 1% of the drug is actually getting where we want it to go. Um, so this was published in, 20, you know, we, we published our studies on this in 2011, and, you know, there are key thing, you know, things here. Um, we're really, there were limitations to this, and I know there are several clinical trials ongoing with AAV9 intravenously, but you know, there are some logistical challenges like the high doses that need to be delivered, um, high peripheral organ transduction, and importantly, the exclusion of any patients that are coming into the trial with, with pre-existing antibodies. So, you know, we, we took an early uh, tack on this to try to say, you know, how can we improve the results with intravenous AAV9? And, uh, and conceptually, we were looking at we could try to either modify the virus or we could try to modify the route. And of course, modifying the route would be a simple solution. And, uh, and this moved us into doing intrathecal administration of AAV9. And it was really Mark Zilka at UNC Chapel Hill when I was there that taught us how to do this. And, and now we've gotten quite good at doing lumbar punctures in mice. Um, it is challenging, but um, uh, we're, we're getting good at it. <coughs> So this is just a quick look at, you know, basically as good as it gets. Um, this is AAV9 injected intrathecally in mice. Uh, you know, again, a lumbar intrathecal injection, and, and we have some histology images here and also the biodistribution data. And, um, and this is basically a, a dose in the mice that would correspond to, you know, roughly a 10 cc injection in a human, so something that would be routinely done. Um, and the concentration of the vector is close to 10 to the 14th per mil. So unless you start going to an atypical volume, this is really the most that we can deliver um, into, the, into the CSF space. And so you'll see a mixture of neurons and astrocytes being transduced. Uh, but the biodistribution of it, if you just look by gene copy number, we're treating the spinal cord very well. Um, and in the brain, we're probably getting on the order of, you know, at, at a very maximum 5 to 20 percent of cells. Um, but if you look at the distribution of peripheral organs, now we're getting, you know, a more even ratio of CNS transduction to periphery rather than this 100 to 1 or greater ratio um, from an IV route. So 
Um, you know, that, that's the results in mice. We worked with Nick Boulis very early to, to model these injections in pigs, 15-kilogram uh, pigs, to model a uh, human injection. And in this case, again, it was a very good um, targeting across the spinal cord, particularly the spinal cord motor neurons and dorsal root ganglia. And, um, and in the brain, actually, you know, uh, we, we could get pretty substantial transduction. Um, we moved this further into non-human primates, and this was published in 2013. Um, and, and the take-home of this uh, is that, you know, our findings were that intrathecal administration can overcome a lot of the barriers of, of intravenous administration. Uh, namely, you know, we can use a lower overall dose. We can avoid, um, you know, at least lower levels of neutralizing antibodies in the serum that would be present more from um, natural infections of AAV. And, and now we have this more balanced pattern of transduction between um, you know, the central nervous system and, and the periphery. Uh, but you know, I, I, I want to say overall, I think that both the intravenous and the intrathecal route, both of them will get the job done. You know, it's just a matter of dosing things properly and, and really considering things like manufacturing logistics. So I'm going to take a short segue. Um, you know, I talked about modifying the route of administration. You know, my, my lab does do quite a bit of work trying to modify the virus. And the, uh, um, like a lot of presentations during this meeting um, uh, have been the focus of, we've been doing work on directed evolution for, you know, probably about 10 years now. And, uh, and you know, the, the track that we're taking is, is really the capsid shuffling version of directed evolution. So it's fragmenting the capsid genes with DNAs. Um, reassembling those in a, in a somewhat random fashion, and then generating a library of, you know, our library is on the order of, you know, maybe 100,000 variants. Um, now, you know, in terms of the input uh, in that library, it's naturally occurring AAVs, and then it's en rationally engineered lab strains, and then it's capsids that have come from previous directed evolution strategies. So, you know, I think that we have a, a, a good diversity of different functional features that go into these libraries. And I was going to present, uh, you know, just a couple slides on some of the outputs of that library. One is, you know, we have been doing work on developing new capsids for intrathecal administration of AV. And this is just data. This is actually a collection that we, we did this screen about four or five years ago um, and generate a, a new collection of about 64 capsids. And this is just showing, um, you know, 10 of these that... Uh, at least in mice, are performing, you know, the, the black bar on this graph is AV9 as a reference, and so we've got a number of clones that are as good or, or better than AV9 in terms of getting to the brain. And if you look at the liver, they're also, you know, many of them are detargeted for the liver. So we have increased specificity um, uh, going to the target and increased efficiency. Now, I'm not jumping up and down, and I'm still using AV9 for most of our applications because in my view, AAV9 is kind of a gold standard. It's tried and true. We know what it's going to do and how it's going to translate to humans. These are, you know, perhaps exciting, but they're still unknown quantities until we can verify that they'll work in a monkey. Um, another example of, of an output from this is a collaboration that I did with Thomas McCown at UNC, uh, and we ended up selecting an AAV capsid that targets oligodendrocytes. Um, this is a cell type that has typically been difficult to target with AAV, and we were able to shift the tropism of, you know, most natural AAVs will be about 90 95% neurons if you inject them intracranially, and this shifted from 95% oligodendrocytes. Um, so, you know, we, we published the, uh, the overall selection strategy and generation of this capsid, um, but then we, we went further and we um, collaborated with Jeff Kordauer and Ron Mandel to, to look at the translatability of this, and, and um, you know, happily found out that its, its performance and its behavior translates pretty effectively from rodents to non-human primates. Um, and then uh, Pella Leon um, uh, got this vector from us and, and used it to successfully treat a mouse model of Canavan disease. So, you know, that was kind of my segue, um, really talking about our work, um, you know, just some highlights of our work in terms of trying to develop approaches to target the nervous system. Um, but really, our mission is bringing these treatments to disease. And, um, 
you know, all of our work with AAV is really to generate tools and generate approaches. Um, but I can, I can go back, you know, I'm a, I'm a PhD scientist, I'm a basic researcher, my, my background is molecular biology. Um, I had no contact with patients, um, but in 2008 something happened that changed my life when I met uh, this girl, Hannah Sames, and her parents, Lori and Matt, and that changed my life forever. And it was a situation where I was able to go back to the lab and not be able to promise anything except that we would do the best that we could. Um, but I had the face of somebody in my head every day that I was working to help. So Hannah was diagnosed with a disease called giant axonal neuropathy. Um, there's still, we, we're aware of less than 100 kids in the world that have this disease. But uh, Hannah's prognosis was that she would lose the ability to walk, um, lose the function of her arms, lose the ability to talk and to swallow. And eventually, she would die around 20 years old, most likely of a respiratory infection. And she was told that um, nobody could do anything about this. So, uh, so Lori and Matt started this foundation, Hannah's Hope Fund, and um, to try to tackle this disease and try to change the future. Um, so when we started this in 2008, the technology didn't exist to treat this disease, but we were embarking on, on a mission of hope. Uh, so here you can see the visual progression of GAN, um, and it, it's, it's basically a, it's a loss of function um, disease, uh, uh, autosomal recessive disease um, of the GAN gene that encodes gigaxanin. Uh, when you're missing this gene, you get accumulation and disorganization of intermediate filaments broadly across multiple cell types. Um, and the hallmark of the disease is that you get these giant swollen axons filled with neurofilaments. Let's see. So, you know, taking, um, we were really doing all of this work with AAV9 and developing these approaches to target the CNS with the express purpose of treating GAN. Um, and so this is the approach that we ended up developing. It was um, packaging the gigaxin and se um, sequence with a, a weak minimal promoter within a self-complementary genome, packaging it in the AV9 capsid, and primarily our targets going in were to treat the spinal cord and the DRG, but you know, we wanted to get as much into the brain as we could as well. Um, and, and really, to some extent, probably every cell in the body needed to be rescued. We obviously couldn't do that, so we embarked on this as um, viewing this as a treatment, but, but probably not a cure. Um, we did, I could spend about two hours going through all the experiments that we did to try to show that, um, that the AV9 GAN therapy was safe and effective, but um, you, can, you can look up this paper if you want to read the details. Um, this work is really spearheaded by Rachel Bailey, who's now an assistant professor at UT Southwestern. Uh, but importantly, you know, in addition to the efficacy here, we observed, you know, in GLP toxicology studies, no toxicity in 120 mice, 14 monkeys, and 60 rats. Um, so this uh, was, you know, really a favorable um, body of evidence to move forward into a first in human um, gene therapy trial. So this is kind of the timeline of, of what we were doing. Um, you know, between 2008 and 2011, I'll say this was where we got good lab results. Um, we developed the approach to try to deliver the gene to the CNS, validated it in pigs and monkeys, um, and, and did the proof of concept in the GAN mouse, which is really a terrible model. Um, but we, we were able to use it um, and, and at least provide some evidence for benefit. We went to the FDA in January 2012 for a pre-IND meeting uh, to propose to do something that had never been done in a human being. And, um, you know, not just delivering the GAN gene, but really doing this intrathecal administration of AAV9. Um, and they were incredibly receptive and, and in the end, incredibly helpful. Um, our experience at the FDA is, was, was fantastic. Um, but then uh, I, I started moving into a realm of things that I was very unfamiliar with pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, toxicology studies, clinical trial design that I was, had you know, really no training um, or expertise in, but I was surrounded by a very good environment and a very uh, uh, supportive group of people that helped me through this. And so in 2014, 2015, we went through the, all the regulatory agencies um, 
And this, you know, kind of miraculous thing happened in 2015 where we started a phase one clinical trial. And I, I'll note that everything, pretty much 100% of this up until the phase one trial was funded by uh, this private foundation, Hannah's Hope Fund. Um, and I want to acknowledge right now Karsten Bonneman at the NIH. He's the PI on the clinical trial. Uh, and, and I really want to acknowledge him because, you know, for me as a, as a bench researcher, um, he's been an incredible collaborator and, and much more than that, I think an incredible mentor for me in terms of, you know, really how to do clinical and translational research. Um, so, you know, Karsten, Karsten was great enough uh, or gracious enough um, to devote a lot of his resources to starting this trial and running it at the NIH Clinical Center. And, and we hit this milestone in May of 2015. Uh, first in human intrathecal gene transfer to broadly treat a, a CNS disease, you know, for any disease. Um, and, and so here we have Karsten and Diana Baruka Gobel and, um, and Lori Sames. And, and, you know, I've got to say again, you know, just, you know, maybe to get a little bit sentimental, um, for me as a, as a bench researcher and, you know, just, just really getting into this realm of knowing patients, um, to be in the OR and see something that we developed that came out of my lab go into a child. Um, it was, it's, it's really life-changing. I, I won't take anything away from seeing my kids being born, but this was a close second. <laughs> um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> and, you know, just to, just to kind of wrap up the story a little bit, uh, this is a message um, that, that uh, Lori posted on the Hannah's Hope website. So you can see, uh, you know, this was a situation where, um, you know, I, I, I don't, we're still trying to work towards a happy ending, but we're, we're at least making progress and providing hope. Uh, and I will say, you know, GAN, the, this treatment is not a cure, um, uh, but um, if you know, there's going to be some presentations later today and also uh, tomorrow morning on this, if you want to learn more about the clinical trial and the progression, it's, it's coming up on um, four years now that this has been going on. So DEMA will present um, the safety, uh, interim um, analysis of safety and efficacy, and then Diana Baruka Gobel will uh, present on all the immune analysis that's been done. And, uh, and I'll just say with this that uh, this has been, you know, not just a, uh, an approach to try to treat GAN, but the information that we're learning from this trial, particularly around the safety and the immune responses, has really catapulted um, our ability to try to bring this as a platform approach to treat multiple diseases, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, so, you know, how does this happen for such a rare disease? And I think this is something that we should all think about, um, and, and how, honestly, this usually happens. And I can say, how did it happen for such a rare disease is because of this woman here who wrangled all the scientists who um, organized the first ever inter international symposium on GAN and invited the right people to that meeting um, uh, to, to move this forward. But it also took a committed, supportive community of lots of volunteers that raised a lot of money. You know, they, they raised about $6 million in six years um, for a small foundation in upstate New York. Um, this is, you know, this is moving mountains. And unfortunately, this is the burden that often falls on um, parents of really sick kids. And when you talk about what this looks like and the reality of what this looks like, um, I, I can't fathom. And this is something I think we all have to keep in mind as we're doing our work, and a lot of our work uh, is inspired by patients and very often it's funded from patients and patient groups. And we have to remember all the effort and the sweat and the blood and the tears that go into every dollar that they raise. And we have to be good stewards of that. And we have to, you know, we have to honor them and be committed to their interests over ours. So what are the magic ingredients? If I can, you know, just be uh, a little grandiose here is, you know, in my opinion, link scientists and families. Uh, you definitely have to have compassion if you're in the rare disease space. Um, compassion won't do it by itself. So we have to know what we're doing. 
and you have to have accountability. And I think that if you have patients in your mind as you go to work every day, there's no better accountability. And obviously money has to come from somewhere, uh, and often that's as big of a barrier as anything else. So this is, this is some of my everyday inspiration, and these are diseases that we work on. Um, these are families that I've come to know uh, that are counting on us, and I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to make a statement now that on this uh, slide, uh, so three of these kids are no longer with us. Um, because despite our best efforts, we can't move fast enough. But we're going to keep move on so that uh, all of these families are still supporting what we're doing because they want to make sure that other families coming after them don't go through what they went through. So this is, this is overall the scope of what my lab is doing. We're obviously, we're doing capsid development work. We're also doing um, a lot of immunology work, uh, trying to understand immune responses. But this is kind of our pipeline of all the different diseases that we're working on at the moment. There's probably about five or six diseases that we're, we're really thinking hard about whether we can take on in addition to this. Um, but you'll see, you know, GAN is the thing that blazed the trail. It's in clinical trial for four years, but now we have, um, you know, eight or nine other diseases that we're actively working to move into a clinical trial based on encouraging preclinical data. Uh, and, then a, and then a pile of diseases kind of on the discovery side um, be behind that. So what I was going to do for, you know, the rest of this is uh, rather than go through all the data on all of these, which would take forever, I want to highlight, because, uh, you know, almost all of these in the IND enabling, we have, um, there's, there's people from my lab and our collaborators that are presenting this data. So I'm just going to kind of give a, a highlight on each one of these, and, you know, some of these presentations have already happened. Uh, you can stream them if you want, but this is... You know, the first disease is aspartyl glucosaminuria. This is lysosomal storage disease. And this is just data that was presented yesterday by Shin Chen in my lab that shows um, kind of a nice dose response of long-term persistence of gene expression uh, after, after the one dose in pre-symptomatic or post-symptomatic mice. And, and importantly, looking at um, the, the toxic substrate that accumulates, that we see a nice dose response um, reduction of this. Um, we're also working with uh, the laboratory of Jagdeep Walia uh, on Tay-Sachs and Sandhoff disease. It's actually one, one vector that will treat both of those, and then another vector that would treat GM2 uh, AB variant, um, form of GM2 gangliosidosis. So there are three posters. Two were presented yesterday. Um, another will be tonight if you want to go by um, and check those out. Um, but it's really showing nice uh, long-term correction of GM2 gangliosidosis, uh, behavioral improvements, increased survival, and, uh, you know, and, and also working towards immune tolerance because the, these mice do mount an immune response against the hexasamindidase that's being expressed. So we've been trying to manage that in the mice. Um, there's also, uh, you know, doing work with um, preclinical gene therapy for Charcot-Marie tooth disease, type 4J. Um, no disease has ever had a worse branding problem than Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Um, uh, uh, has nothing to do with teeth. But, um, <clears throat> but this has been a, a really outstanding collaboration with Jackson Labs where uh, uh, basically, the, you know, we worked, they had the mouse model. Uh, we worked with them to design this study and, and they, uh, they carried it out and have done an absolutely fantastic job with it. Um, this is a really severe mouse model. I think the median life expectancy of these mice is something about you know, 30 days. And, uh, and treatment at postnatal day one, we, we have basically you know, long-term, um, you know, uh, very comprehensive correction of the disease. And, uh, and when we treat mice that are really very symptomatic at seven days old, then we, we see a nice extension of survival, but again, not a complete rescue. Um, this is a challenging disease because the gene is too big. It requires a single-stranded AAV genome, which is less efficient. And, um, uh, and again, this mouse model is very aggressive. Um, there's also uh, a disease called multiple sulfatase deficiency. I think we're in the, you know, maybe two or three dozen patients that we know of in the world. Um, right now that has this. There, there are certainly more than that, but uh, this is a very severe aggressive disease in kids. 
Um, and the mouse model is also very severe. The, the median survival of these mice is about 11 or 12 days. Um, but this is just a survival curve where we, you know, again, the mice, the median survival is 11 or 12 days. We treated them at seven days old, and we're getting a, a very nice rescue of this disease long term. Uh, and I should say, you know, this also included uh, treating wild-type mice with high doses of the vector, and, and, and you know, it's, it has a very good safety profile thus far. Um, oh, and, and this is, I should say, this is Rachel Bailey that will be presenting this Thursday morning. Uh, this was presented yesterday, but this is uh, intrathecal. This is moving, these were all sort of single route um, administrations. Uh, we were doing work with infantile neuronal ceroid lipofusinosis. This is the, the most severe form of Batten disease. And um, we, this has been a very, very large study. It's been going on for quite a while, uh, where we moved into doing intrathecal in injections, basically reaching the maximum dose that we could by that route, and then moving into um, doing combinations of IV and, intra and intrathecal dosing as a way to continue to dose escalate. And, and this is something where, if you, you know, in pre-symptomatic mice, we can get, um, you know, very good extension of survival, um, near, you know, getting close to normalizing survival uh, in these mice with, with, you know, accompanying behavioral improvements. Um, but the, the mice-treated post-symptom onset has been a really, a real challenge. And the combination dose actually had, this is that pink line, really had a substantial increase. Um, and it was just a doubling of the dose. We just split it between intrathecal and intravenous. Um, and then there, there's two more things that, that, uh, that you can go and, and hear more information about, and they're both large animal studies. So everything that I presented up until now, you know, this is all in mice. Um, you know, we had already done the groundwork with reporter vectors showing sort of the translatability of, of AV9 from mice to rats to pigs to monkeys. Um, but for me, you know, knowing that, uh, having data on that is one thing, but really seeing that the treatment is working in large animal models is incredibly rewarding to me. And I, I got to go to New Zealand um, uh, earlier this year and, and see these sheep for the first time, and it was really cool. Um, seeing this flock of sheep that shouldn't be alive and they're running around and uh, so uh, it's really Dave Palmer and Nadia Mitchell that are leading this at Lincoln University in, um, in New Zealand. Uh, they have a, a sheep, naturally occurring sheep model for CLN5 Batten disease and you know these sheep die about 20 uh, months old um, and they have this Batten disease rating scale that is analogous to uh, a human scale for this disease. And so you can see that the turquoise um, uh, dots are showing the natural progression of this disease in untreated sheep. And then the gray, you know, the, the blue dots are, are normal, unaffected sheep. Um, and then the gray dots are sheep that are treated at various stages in the disease progression. So you can see that when they're treated very early, their, their outcomes are quite good. And then when they're treated later, it, it, it doesn't reverse the disease, but it does halt the progression. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the last thing that I was going to wrap up with is uh, a, a talk that will be um, later today that I think would be, would be very exciting to see. This is... Um, Allison Bradbury uh, is our collaborator at University of Pennsylvania that works under Charles Veet. Um, and uh, they have a canine model of Crab A disease. And, um, and so we've been doing work uh, with them. You know, we designed an AV9 vector carrying the Gal C gene that these dogs are missing. Um, and, and in this case, uh, the dogs, normally their median survival is about 16 weeks, and now we've got uh, initially four dogs at a year and a half old with no symptoms. Um, but the, the, the limitation on this is that if we lower the dose or if we treat the dogs later, it's not, not fully effective. Um, it, it's, it's actually much less effective. And so this is a theme that is recurring across um, a lot of the diseases that I work on where it really is very critical to try to treat early. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wrote a commentary about this a couple years ago that I think the gene therapy field needs to be uh, really, really friendly with the newborn screening field um, for a lot of our treatments to be as good as they can possibly be. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to end off with a couple of slides, one just talking about rare disease, and I, I hope a lot of people recognize this, but I, I think it's worth saying. Um, we're all working on genetic diseases, and, and almost entirely these fall into the rare disease spectrum. But, you know, this is over 7,000 rare diseases. This number grows every year as, you know, I think um, uh, uh, all the human genomics work gets more um, comprehensive. But, you know, collectively about 8% of the U.S. population will have one of these rare diseases. And 80% of them are genetic. So this really falls under our responsibility as a society. Um, you know, there are other ways to treat these diseases, but 80% of them are genetic. This is gene therapy. Um, this is our responsibility. Uh, I think what makes this really difficult is that 50% of these patients are children, and 30% of those children will not live to see their fifth birthday. These are really difficult numbers. Um, and, and uh, further, less than 5% of these have FDA-approved treatments. So this is our responsibility. Um, we need to do the best that we can. We have a lot of limitations of the technology that we have, but it's getting better. Um, and, you know, I think there's about 6,000 people, if I heard right, that are attending this meeting, and there's 7,000 rare diseases, so let's, let's go to work. <laughs> uh, all right, so you know my 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 approach on this: How do you tackle 7,000 rare diseases that affect one in 10 Americans at some point in their lives? Is you know one disease at a time. Uh, how do you how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> one bite at a time. How do we tackle a problem this big? One disease at a time. But we do this by trying to develop platform treatment approaches that can go across dozens or even hundreds of different diseases. And I think this is how we can really tackle this problem and create roadmaps for how people can just, you know, pick up a genetic disease, look to see if it makes sense, and, and, and there's just certain steps that have to be followed. And I think that this can become easier and easier as we go along if we work together. So I want to end off right now uh, acknowledging my team. Um, there, there are a lot of people that I need to acknowledge, but um, first and foremost, these are the people that make me look good. Um, they're, they're incredibly dedicated, incredibly hardworking, and, and, um, uh, and I think probably smarter than I am. Um, so, you know, and I have a number of people that aren't pictured. Uh, we do have a vector core that I'm building at UT Southwestern that will include GMP manufacturing, and this has been an incredible uh, undertaking and endeavor. But um, I will say, you know, our, our group kind of can't grow fast enough with everything that we're trying to do, so we are growing. <laughs> And I'll make a plug. Uh, we have positions available um, in, in the research lab and also in the vector core. If you want to come to Dallas, the cost of living is pretty good. Uh, and it's not all cowboys and rattlesnakes, I promise. <clears throat> um, but also I want to acknowledge, uh, like I said, there's a lot of people that have contributed to this. I, I like to think that I play well with others. Um, so, you know, kind of the, I, I came from UNC Chapel Hill. I want to acknowledge my mentor, Jude Samolsky, who, who pro, you know, provided an outstanding training environment for me. Uh, the different collaborators that I, I'm still interacting with there. Um, of course, my NIH collaborators on the GAN trial, Jackson Laboratory. It's been a, a fantastic effort working with them. Um, Lincoln, Kingston, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I want to acknowledge Nick Bulis and his, his team at Emory to help us with those initial uh, pig studies. And, you know, uh, of course, everything that we do um, started with a parent reaching out to us and sometimes forming a foundation and, and funding us with their first grant. Um, so I, I take that as an extremely uh, powerful responsibility. We try to honor that as best as we can. Um, so anyway, that's where I'll leave off, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve, uh, for this uh, outstanding lecture. So now floor is open for any questions to, uh, for Steve. Hello. Wonderful talk here this side. 
Uh, Steve, um, so one question for the uh, intrathecal injection. A lot of time we were asked really how many cells are really uh, infected? What's the percentage of the cells are infected that could give the minimal effective therapeutic effect? Well, I think that's an entirely disease dependent. And uh, I think there's also a big difference when you talk about a therapeutic effect versus a, a cure. And a therapeutic effect is a very sliding scale from a minimum effect that you can detect to something that is actually transformative and life-changing. Um, so in terms of how, what percentage of cells that we're targeting in the brain, you know, if I had to put a number on it, I think with AV9 we're not getting higher than 20 or 30 percent at, at the maximum. Um, and if you have a secreted protein, like Crab A disease or AGU or CLN1, I think that you know, if you target 5% of cells and you get the expression right, I mean, you might be able to comprehensively treat everything. But diseases like GAN, where there is no cross-correction, are much more difficult. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions. Oh, there's one, sorry. Um, as someone heavily involved in phase one trials for rare diseases, what do you think of new right to try, as it's called, legislation? Has that had a positive, negative, or no real impact for the patients you work with? I mean, to be honest, I think uh, I haven't seen it have much of an impact at all one way or the other. Um, I, I think that there are expanded access provisions by the FDA. Uh, they're better to talk about this than I am. But, you know, this is something that, um, for me personally, we're, we're trying to do a lot. We're stretched very, very thin trying to do everything that we're doing. And uh, if I, and I think that kind of moving forward a single patient IND is pretty much just as much work as organizing a clinical trial, uh, an actual rigorous clinical trial. And if I'm going to expend that effort, this is me personally, I would rather do something that would benefit a large number of patients from here until forever rather than trying to treat one patient. So the, the question was around um, newborn screening and kind of implementing this technology and strategies to identify these patients earlier. And I think, you know, the, the process of getting something added to newborn screening is, I mean, easily a five or ten or longer year process. And, uh, and I think that we're going to face with a lot of these diseases that we're all working on that uh, it's going to be a chicken and egg. You're going to have to have that evidence for that early intervention is really important, but it's going to be really hard to get that evidence unless you have newborn screening uh, or, or, or early diagnosis. And so, um, I mean, I'd love to see some, some thoughtful conversations and sort of strategic thinking around how to do this, even to do pilot studies, because right now I think we're limited by... Um, you know, maybe we identify a younger sibling or something of these, like, infrequent events that happen where we have this opportunity to treat ch children before symptoms. But it's really critical. Yeah. Hey, hey, Steve, thanks for the shout-out. It means a lot. Um, I just wanted to kind of augment what you said about uh, right to try. Just so people understand, right to try applies to situations where phase one has already been conducted and, therefore, the therapy has been proved safe. At that point, the legislation kicks in. So I, I agree with Steve, phase one, you, you, do, you don't have that option. But if you want to open expanded access and you want to do right to try, really what's going on now is the legislation exists. It now needs to be um, brought into reality. And that, those are really local fights. So we're currently fighting to try and bring neural stem, which are the cell transplant for ALS, um, out through right to try because we weren't able to raise the money for a big phase three. So, um, so it, it is viable, but it really involves finding the right people to push it on a local level. Yeah, and, and, and obviously when, when you really talk about, say you have encouraging phase one data, 
uh, showing safety and some efficacy. This is a situation where expanded access is really meant to apply. Um, but in a lot of the cases, we're really struggling to manufacture what we need to support our clinical trials. And you know, even if we wanted to, there's usually not excess vector laying around um, to treat patients through expanded access. So, I mean, this, I think everything that is being presented this week and everything that everybody is working on from manufacturing and new capsid development to strategies for clinical trials, I mean, all of these things all work together to solve these problems. And um, I, I don't know, it, it, it's great to see everything that's happening. I think it's a bright future, but it's not, it's never going to come fast enough. That was a fantastic talk. I just wanted to ask you whether you or your colleagues have been looking at possible AAV integration in the genome? We haven't been focusing really, to be honest, this is something that my lab personally hasn't been focusing very heavily on looking at AAV integration. I mean, it's something that I think we all acknowledge happens. Um, I think that there have been some very large studies in um, older animals that have shown no association with AAV and tumors in mice. Uh, there, there are obviously the studies um, showing that this can happen in newborn mice, uh, but I think that that's a different situation than what, you know, any of the, any of the human therapies are going to encounter. Of course, there's always, we don't know what we don't know, but that's, that's that. But I just wonder whether in some of those clinical trials that you are referring to, it's possible to collect surrogate material where you can look at AAV integration in human cells? So we're not, in terms of the trials that we're doing that are really CNS directed, we're not doing any kind of biopsies um, to try to look in tissue at what would be happening. I think our only opportunity to do that in, in the trials that we're designing are going to be um, if there's an opportunity for post-mortem, which obviously we don't want that opportunity. But uh, it, it, just in terms of when we're trying to treat the CNS and the, and the trials that we're working on, I, unfortunately, I think that there's not a good opportunity for that. Oh. But, you know, we can always be looking in non-human primates and other animal models. I was just wondering whether circulating blood cells or something that could be harvested from the patient would provide some surrogate uh, tissue to look at that. Sorry, I, I didn't understand that completely. But Sorry, uh, whether uh, circulating cell populations that could be harvested from the patients yeah, could provide. Yeah, I mean, I think that AAV isn't going to necessarily be targeting the blood cells uh, necessarily, uh, so that may be a bad population to be trying to look at for integration. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks to everyone and uh, to Steve. Let's give a warm round of applause. Uh, congratulations.